As my fellow panelists uh, get seated, uh, and before we begin, uh, and I will introduce each of them, I'd also like to state that Davis Polk and Sullivan Cromwell, firms where two of our panelists are currently employed, provide generous support to economic studies that makes the work we do possible. I'd like to reiterate Brookings' commitment to independence and underscore that the views expressed today are solely those of the speakers. That brings me to introducing this distinguished panel. I'll start uh, immediately to my left and work down. Uh, Rajan Cohen is the best described, the best introduction I've heard of Rajan is he's the counsel to the situation. Uh, Rajan, uh, one of the foremost banking experts in the country, senior partner at Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, Kathleen Day is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, She's had a distinguished career as a journalist, as a consumer advocate, uh, and is somebody who has covered multiple financial crises and written lengthy books, including a new one forthcoming. January uh, 8th. Yale University uh, Press. Help uh, help us better understand the commonalities between the various financial crises that many of us in this room have lived through. Uh, Chris Brummer is hot off the press at Georgetown University, where he conducted, I think, the certainly Washington's preeminent fintech week, but perhaps the nation's preeminent fintech week. Uh, and I appreciate uh, you joining us and being able to shift gears from the future of technology to the current regulatory structure. Uh, uh, Randy Gwynn uh, is the uh, person who probably has spent the most time thinking about how to solve the failure element of too big to fail, both from a policy perspective and from an institution, uh, real world perspective. Uh, There is nobody I've ever met uh, who understands living wills, uh, uh, the TLAC capital regime, and the intellectual structure behind that better than Randy, uh, who who runs uh, the Davis Polk practice in this and, and thinks deeply and holistically about these issues. Uh, So with that, knowing who the panel is, I want to try to do something that uh, is rarely done, which is I want the panel to react to the speech uh, and what Governor Quarles said. And in that way, I'd like you to just hold your comments. I think Governor Quarles committed to the Fed introducing one policy statement, seeking three notices, uh, having multiple changes in regulation, all in real time, not Fed time. Uh, but let's start by just reacting to the uh, substance within Governor Quarles' statements on stage, and we'll broaden it out uh, in a little bit. But, Rajan, what was your takeaway? Uh, my takeaway was that the uh, commentators who have said this is a do-nothing uh, Federal Reserve are about 180 degrees off the mark. Uh, you can hear what is coming. Uh, I think... Uh, the vice chairman was very clear about what real time means. I mean, he started with a biblical reference, and I've always thought the Fed sort of worked in biblical time. You know, everybody lived to 500 years, and so you had all that time. But I think he's very committed, uh, and I think what you've heard is that the basic building blocks of the post-2008 regime will remain intact, but it's time to take a look at all the extraneous accoutrements that have been built in and see whether they really are necessary and really work. Okay, well, I'm going to take my longer. No, no I'm just focused. Just on what he said today. To translate it in the vernacular is things are great. Checks in the mail. This is what people said right before long-term capital, right before the meltdown. Um, we have as much complexity. It, it's a new bunch of alphabet soup with, you know, F socks and all these things. But I think there's a lot of confidence that history might challenge. Chris? I viewed uh, uh, really the remarks as a continuation of a process that was initiated. And I think it is, uh, by all accounts, a much more ambitious process than many people first uh, had anticipated. Uh, to uh, move the regulatory pendulum in a direction uh, that allows for more uh, flexibility, uh, for sure, uh, but it's being operationalized in a highly technical manner. uh, uh, That does create certain real questions uh, as to the long-term robustness of uh, uh, our response mechanisms should uh, the economy start to slow. So it's interesting, three 
uh, guiding principles that has guided what uh, Vice Chairman Quarles has done in the Federal Reserve over the last few uh, last year or so has really been by Quarles, which is uh, sim transparency, simplicity, and efficiency. And I thought the speech today was interesting because it was very transparent. One of the things that I've learned over the process of seeing so many rules be proposed and um, and implemented, implementing Dodd-Frank and things, is that it tends to be a static process where you have a proposal, you submit a bunch of comment letters, you hear nothing, and then you see the final rule come out. What, I, what I've learned over that process is a better process would be much more of a give and take over a period of time. And what I thought was really refreshing in uh, Vice Chairman Corral's speech today was how he actually talked about a number of the comments and how they're thinking about them as opposed to it being a, a black box. And I think that that's really positive. I think having much more of a dynamic comment process so that we actually get to the right result um, is better than what I think I've seen a bit more in the past in other areas. So, so let, me, let me pull on that string a little bit because I, mean, I think the Fed can be uh, 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 commended in great detail for embracing huge increases in transparency and monetary policy over the last 25 years. Uh, and there was a theme, I, I agree with you, of an increase in transparency throughout his speech until you got to the very end, when on the qualitative remarks, the comment was, we're going to pull back the public element of it, creating less transparency, and handle things in a confidential manner. Did anybody see that as a tension between the, the broad themes? Well, it's interesting. I, I guess what I would say, as opposed to commenting on, you know, was that a pullback by him? I'm not sure. That certainly is a characteristic of the supervisory process. I personally think the supervisory process should be more transparent. Um, I'm not sure it can be as transparent as a matter of reality as monetary policy, but I think it could be a lot more transparent than it is now. I think if you went back in history, and one of my partners, Meg Tyre, has written a piece on this, uh, the, the scope of information that was considered to be confidential supervisory information was much more limited than it is today. I think the perimeter of confidential supervisory information is much too broad, and I would like to see more transparency. I guess I think that Vice Chairman Quarles and the General Counsel Mark Vanderweide are proponents of more transparency, but it takes time to, to, uh, to have that be realized. You know, Aaron, I, <clears throat> I think we're talking about really two different but related terms here. One is transparency, and the other, which I think Randy very much was focusing on as well, is meaningful dialogue. And dialogue, you listen to one another, you just don't talk at each other. And I think uh, what you are hearing from the vice chairman is the opportunity for meaningful dialogue. And uh, I will express my views that I do not think meaningful dialogue translates into regulatory capture. It really does mean listening. I just, one thing I hadn't thought of until this moment when the comment period was brought up, lately there has been some question about whether the comment process, uh, how, how you're going to preserve the integrity of it. There's been, uh, the Wall Street Journal did a, a, a review that some of the things for the FCC, some of the SEC comments, I think some of the regulatory comments for to the Fed have been fake and, and uh, astroturf. So, and, and no, no agency has really pursued that. So it's great to have a dialogue. I just hope it's not with bots and <laughs> it's real people. Yeah. You know, I, I think that there are different kinds of uh, transparency. Uh, you know, I think I would also uh, applaud the governor and the, to the extent to which you have any public official who's willing to engage uh, uh, the public about the thinking behind those decisions. Uh, there is always this tension, of course, uh, when you want to introduce transparency and the other aspects of, uh, administ of, of administrative policymaking, such as, for example, the transparency with the metrics behind your stress testing. You know, one of the things uh, that I've written about, in, in, and we call it a the trilemma, usually with fintech, for the, the innovation and, uh, and the difficulty of writing rules for financial innovation, but I think here it's also applicable, is that there's usually a, a we already talk about a trilemma as, as, you know, with economists, but for regulators, there's often a trilemma between clear rules, market integrity, and financial innovation. That you can get two, but not all three. That you can get clear rules and market integrity, but it usually comes 
in the form of prohibitions that can impact financial innovation. You can have market integrity and financial innovation, but sometimes that'll come at uh, the cost of complexity. And then you can have financial innovation and clear rules, but then sometimes that'll come at the cost of uh, market integrity. And here you see attempting approaches to accommodate that trilemma in administrative rulemaking, right? Uh, both in terms of the dialogue uh, process uh, with the public and an attempt to change the way in which uh, the stress tests themselves are operationalized from an ex ante perspective. Right? Now, the question is, you know, again, historically speaking, you can only get two of the three, but maybe as to how you stand between those poles, depending on the, the toolbox and how you design the tools, which can engage and involve public engagement, or it can uh, literally, uh, you can have changes in the regulatory uh, rulemaking process and the way in which you design different stress testing scenarios and how much of the rule book or the textbook or the rule or the lecture that you want to uh, provide in advance. Um, and you can sort of move the dial, but sometimes there's, there's a trade-off involved. And part of the conversation that will no doubt uh, come from his remarks will be just how far in one direction are they pushing in terms of those trade-offs. So let's broaden the conversation a bit uh, beyond just what Governor Corll said today to the whole suite of changes that have gone on uh, since the passage of Dodd-Frank and, and the crisis moving towards regulation and now fine-tuning or, or pulling some of it back. Uh, the Fed had a giant sweeping proposal with four new tiers uh, that came out, was a subject of some uh, dissent, which is rare among the Federal Reserve voting governors. But l let's react to the broader set of new changes going on at the Fed. Rajan, what's, what's your take? Well, I'll go back, Aaron, to what we were talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, this is not designed, this suite of changes, and there are a number of them, uh, not only the tailoring, but the adoption of the uh, proposal on the new LFI, LFI rating system could have very substantial ramifications. Again, its approach, it is around the edges of what is being done. Uh, you heard the vice chairman say, we're not going to change the basic capital standards. Uh, I see little prospect of a change in the basic liquidity standards. But th you know, it's not uh, surprising that they're going to be flaws and errors in 10 years of regulation, or that the circumstances have changed sufficiently. And I, I think what we're seeing is a relatively comprehensive response to what has occurred in the last 10 years. Kathleen? Can I do the big, he knows I've been waiting to say this. So I think that these comments all have to be taken in a more general, com the general comments on what's been going on at the OCC and the FDIC and if you put all these things together, I'm old enough, I think probably older than anyone on here, I've heard all this before, and um, if I had a nickel for every time I heard transparency, simplicity, and efficiency, and the other two, and this is when I reach for my wallet, is when I hear financial innovation and consumer choice. When you hear those two words, reach for your wallet, <laughs> it typically. So I just would like to take all the things that are some of the main things that have happened with all the regulators, because they do act in concert, uh, and, and, and give them the broad category. So now we have preemption with the OCC's uh, new FinTech charter. If you read through all the lines, what it's really meant to do is clear out the hurdles of being able to go into different states. So now we have preemption, one of the ingredients for the last crisis. Now you have lowering of capital standards, weakening of the Volcker rule, although and I'm not saying none of these things should be changed at all, but you're weakening them a little bit. There you go, cheap credit can easily become easy credit overly leveraged, a problem. Then you have deteriorating standards. You have the OCC saying, oh, let's get uh, the banks. We're not only going to say you can do it, but we encourage you to do payday lending. And you have the CF, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau at the same time saying, and guess what? We're going to lower underwriting standards. No more assessing a person's ability to repay. If you can go into their bank account and take your money back, even if put puts them in financial room, so be it. So now you have this deteriorating standard, and um, with the lowering also of the capital rules, you have more self-regulation. We know how well that went before. And then there's amnesia. The amnesia, Odding at OCC, called the banks he's supposed to regulate his customers. 
Again, reach for your wallet when you hear things like that, because the customer is the U.S. taxpayer and the U.S. public. And uh, finally, uh, I won't go into the fiduciary rule, but that's another bee in my bonnet. Um, I just want to say, in doing my most recent book, I really came to understand that founding fathers did not include the word bank or corporation in the Constitution because they were such divisive issues, and they are still divisive issues. But one thing I think we have forgotten is when you have a federal charter and you have federal deposit insurance, it is a privilege. And with that privilege comes an obligation of regulators to, who extend that privilege to these organizations on behalf of the public and the taxpayer to make sure they remember who their customer is and they go in and regulate with that in mind. And I understand the need not to over-regulate. I, look, I will admit this now. I would never admit another form. I was actually, I joined the Libertarian Party at one point. I don't want regulatory overreach. I'm not there anymore because I don't want to have to pay a toll every, every one mile on the road. But, um, um, but and I'm not quite that far. Those were my younger days. Um, but I, I really do think this idea of having an incorporation and the privileges that a, the, reg, the government bestows by giving it to you and deposit insurance comes with an increased obligation. And I think the regulators forget that. We're all embroiled in all this alphabet soup and F socks and SIFI. I mean, ugh, look at the big picture. So, so there, I've said it. I don't <coughs> say any more. So, so, so that was a lot. And, um, and, and you're... You, I'll, I'll start this way. I, I think that um, you know, if you're just going to stay for the moment, you know, with 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 the Fed, I think you know what I think is a particularly salient point um, that's already been discussed is that these are not choices made in a vacuum, right? That they are instead falling upon other kinds of choices. So you can have decisions relating to uh, lowering certain kinds of capital charges. Uh, you also have uh, the removal of some liquidity requirements for your financial assets for some um, uh, s smaller and medium-sized uh, banks, which is which is a choice. Um, you can always ask yourself, well, you know, are the current standards too stringent? Should they be weakened and be made more appropriate, or should they be eliminated, alto eliminated altogether? And there are certain kinds of choices that are made amongst that along that that particular spectrum. And for some of the uh, banks, it was you know, to remove uh, altogether. Uh, just as with, say, a counter-cyclical buffer, something that was discussed, we are certainly in times of plenty, and there are choices to be made. You know, when you go about an analysis and you ask yourself, looking at the data, is the provision of credit, the rate at which credit is being provided, is it outstripping your GDP growth? As a general matter, that's that's deemed to be a source of some uh, financial instability, or can pretend uh, a future uh, source of financial instability. And depending on what country you are and under what kinds of circumstances, can you implement? It? I don't want to want, want a fiat, but you know these are all important choices that collectively can have an impact on the degree to which regulators not only will be able to respond to a crisis, but can prevent that crisis in the future. In the future. Now, the, the only one thing I, I would push back a, a bit on is that, um, and I do think that all of the financial regulators are looking uh, to uh, operationalize rules that they believe are either more efficient or to looking at rules that they think have, are too burdensome for the provision of financial services. Now, th that, that being said, um, uh, uh, you know, when you look at, say, the OCC charter, is that a question of, of, of preemption? Well, you know, the state regulators who don't like the OCC uh, fintech charter, no doubt about it, aren't necessarily preempted from trying to compete with it, but it does raise interesting questions that the OCC and other banking regulators and even other financial and capital markets regulators are trying to deal with. Um, uh, uh, but that itself is trying to the agenda behind some of these efforts involve uh, questions that I think uh, are worthy of, of, of real attention, uh, like financial inclusion, capital access, uh, and the like, uh, particularly when you look at incumbent uh, players in the market and their ability to uh, service uh, underbanked and the unbanked, as well as, obviously, uh, some of your more traditional uh, financial market participants. 
I talked much longer than I had intended to, but Can there was I a lot. So just, just well, ahead. All right. then I'd like to make two comments. We'll, we'll get back. Pope. So I'm going to stick to the original question, <laughs> which is uh, uh, the uh, tailoring proposal by the Federal Reserve that re recently came out and by the three regulators on capital and liquidity. Um, it's interesting because you see reactions on both sides of this one. Um, so there's, at least at the extremes, uh, they're very unhappy people. So on the one hand, um, there's, there are tweets that say it's a tragic mistake. It's, um, it's going to uh, allow what Kathleen is talking about in terms of um, undercapitalized banks, underliquefied banks. On the other extreme, there are those, uh, I'm not sure I've heard this since that it came out, but at least before there were letters from Congress saying you should exempt completely the banks between 100 and $250 billion in assets the way, um, and that's what, that's what Congress intended by the Economic Growth Act. Um, instead, what the Fed has done is, is it's taken sort of a middle approach. And when you actually look at what has happened, I mean, the, you know, they've sort of got four categories. For those of you who haven't read it, there's four categories, and the GSIBs are in the top category. Very large banks um, or that have cross-border operations are in the second category. Then banks between 100 and 200, uh, sorry, then another category, uh, and then the uh, the last one is between 100 and 250 billion in assets that don't have certain other factors. And if you actually look, and they've got a nice chart at the back, that basically you see that most of the capital liquidity is stress testing it still applies to the largest banks. And to the extent they've been, some of them have been eliminated for the smaller banks, it, there's still internal stress, stress testing on liquidity. There's still um, a lot of the capital requirements in, that are there. So in many ways, it's, it's almost designed to make the people on the extremes unhappy either way it goes. Uh, because it, it is sort of an incremental, modest approach. But I think it's useful in thinking um, about where the Fed has come out in this proposal, and obviously people will comment on, comment on this. Is where did the $50 billion, where did the magical $50 billion threshold come from to begin with? Was it based on some kind of empirical studies that this was a division between systemic and non-systemic? No, I think it was sort of pulled out of the air. In fact, I think it was actually designed to be fairly low, so that the idea was that the Fed would, in fact, um, tailor among institutions about $50 billion. It's just the Fed never really tailored a whole lot until now. So it's interesting to see that. So I, having been there when the Magic 50 number was created, from my memory, uh, I believe the number was purposely set too low because of concerns about moral hazard. There was a giant concern that proved to be uh, well overstated that the market would see any institution over 50 as having a too-big-to-fail promoteur, mm. and it would gain a comparative funding advantage. And if you set the number so low that it became obvious that the government would allow institutions over that number to be failed, the market would be fooled and unclear who would benefit from the imprimatur of moral hazard that I believe was well, uh, uh, turned out to be over, over found it, uh, uh, overblown. But I do want to push back a little bit and, and see the panel thing. So I, I view the Fed as creating three tiers, a tier of GSIBs, mm -hmm. a tier of large regionals that are over 250 and below 700, and then the 100 to 250. That's right. It created a fourth tier, which was one institution, which was Fed speak because we don't want to actually name one institution. So we call Northern Trust tier two. <laughs> so we're not singling out Northern Trust. They just happen to be the only entity in tier two. One of the concerns given in the, in the dissent on this was that the law only addressed 1 to 250. And the Fed's tailoring, which is consistent with other aspects of Dodd-Frank, but was not part of S2155, dealt with the changes to the institutions over this new magic number of 250, uh, which maybe is pulled from the same air as 50, just differently. Uh, how did you see, did, did that surprise you? And do you think the Fed's decision to grant them relief uh, is in the long run best interest of uh, the economy? Chris? Well, I, actually, I, I want to piggyback off that question to, 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 to ask um, uh, Randy's thoughts on that combined with the frequency of the stress testing. Um, you know, if you move from, from a one to two year window, uh, you know, what does that do? Not so much from the standpoint of disciplining mechanism for the supervised, but from the surveillance perspective of the regulator itself in, in terms of its own uh, internal uh, uh, information gathering and, and surveillance. 
So let me, uh, let me just try to answer at least I'd say Aaron's implicit question, and then let me uh, try to answer that one. Um, I actually think the Fed in Dodd-Frank has always had the authority to do the tailoring That's that it's right. done. I don't think it required the Economic Growth Act to actually say it can do it. So the fact that the Economic Growth Act you know, raises the initial threshold from 50 to 100 and then has a, another threshold between 100 and 250 precludes the Fed from saying, well, we'll do further tailoring, which is what they've done with the... And I agree, it's basically three categories, and then there's a GSIB light category, right? Um, or at least global light. Um, and... Uh, um, and I think that that's actually, that's something the Fed probably should have done a long time ago is to tailor more. I'm just not sure that they could do it. They, they were working so hard on getting the basics down that I think it's now the time to sort of look at tailoring. So even though the Economic Growth Act came out and set those thresholds, I think they're probably looking at it more holistically and just say, here's our, and I think actually looking at risk factors as opposed to only size, you know, in other words, asset size is actually a good idea. I'm not sure I agree that the five, risk factors they come up with, including size, are necessarily the right ones or, or equally weighted the way they are in this proposal. But um, cause I, um, uh, but, uh, but I think it's actually the right way of going about it. I think it's more sophisticated than just size thresholds. I was just going to say, uh, you know, it's a question always of where you draw lines. And uh, if you look at the banks in that category, are they closer to the GSIPs? or closer to the uh, regionals in the next tier down? I think it's very clear. It's the latter, not the former. So some modest fo form of tailoring for that group seemed perfectly appropriate, and I agree 100% with Randy that the Fed has clear legal authority uh, to take that action. Again, if we were talking about taking that group and really reducing <coughs> capital requirements or reducing uh, the liquidity requirements, that could be a whole different analysis, but that's not what we're talking about here. Oh. Uh, let me ask a different question about where you draw the line, which is the treatment of foreign banks. They seem to have been, the line seems to be treat, drawing a very different line on foreign banks than it has historically in the United States. And Chris, do you, do you see a global implication there? Is this, is this America first in banking? <laughs> well, you know, whether or not you look at banking, whether or not you look at derivatives uh, as, as, as well, there's, there's always been a propensity. I mean, whether or not you look at the risk weighting for <laughs> sovereign assets, you know, there, there's always been um, uh, certain kinds of advantages um, that have been uh, given to domestic financial institutions, even when it comes to the opera operationalization of, of your uh, banking regulations in light of G20 uh, uh, and FSB and Basel Committee uh, rules, standards, and uh, best practices. Um, certainly, you would expect that this would have uh, the impact of incentivizing local banking in, in, in a way that uh, would have a disparately negative impact on uh, foreign banks. But I, I, do I view this as uh, so beyond or out of sync with certain a past aspects of uh, uh, banking regulation? Uh, uh, no. Now, now, is it uh, contrary to uh, some of the principles of um, cross-border coordination and uh, standard setting? Uh, that were embraced particularly um, in the wake of the financial crisis, I'd, I'd say uh, uh, yes. So, I don't know, I'm a lawyer. It depends. Yeah. The thoughts on the treatment of foreign banks in the new regime? You know, it's the, the Fed has said that they are going to come out quickly. I didn't hear quite the real time that Randy <laughs> was talking about. But I think the foreign banking community, with some justification, believes that it is being, and I'll use the word, discriminated against by the entire American regulatory and law enforcement regime. It is not just the Fed. Uh, but this is a series of enforcement actions, which to the foreign banks seem more severe. It's, as a regulatory matter, you can almost look one more biblical reference. Original sin was the IHC. 
And uh, you know, the IHC was supposed to make foreign banks comparable to US banks in terms of regulation. But now the US regionals are being, uh, their, their regulatory scheme is being changed to some extent, but IHCs, there's still nothing there. And it, it goes, for example, to how they're going to deal with directors. It, it, just a number of issues are coming together, and it is creating real animosity among the foreign banking community. I mean, from, from the FBO's perspective, I think what they see is they are being treated on a global basis now. So, for instance, they're compared to GSIBs if they're a large institution. Historically, I think the way the Fed had devised regulation, it usually focused on U.S. operations. And so from that perspective, they look at themselves and they say, our U.S. operations are a lot more like regional banks than they are like GSIBs, and that's how we ought to be compared to. And so there's a tension between do we compare them at a global level based on their global operations, or do we compare them for regulatory purposes on a local level? And at least their perspective is these are regional bank operations that ought to be compared on a local level. So it, it sounds like then Trumpism is winning a little bit. <laughs> um, let, me, let me go from, from the rest you know, of the world. I mean, and- I mean, I mean you know, it, it is interesting, right? I mean, because we've had iterations of this conversation in this room, you know, uh, uh, but just under very, very different guises. So, you know, when it comes to capitalization and whether or not you're going to force international uh, companies to place all their you know, assets in a per, in a, any particular uh, jurisdiction un, under Tarillo's uh, uh, plan. You know, people could have argued then that that was a you know an America first uh, program, right? Uh, but because you want to make sure that locally there's enough assets, you, know, you can grab whatever you need in cases of financial stress, right? Okay, in this particular instance, you can make similar kinds of comments, and I think it, it depends on the historical context and and. Uh, that's why I think my answer was it depends because it's not unusual for the United States or any other country or jurisdiction to impose uh, rules and regulations that that have a disparate impact. And the international community can, in some cases rightly, uh, identify that treatment as uh, not being consistent with its international either commitments or principles that they uh, embraced elsewhere. You know, if I could, this is such, I'm sorry to keep yeah. continuing, it's such a great question, and, it, and it's a burning issue. I think it's actually coincidental uh, with the America First. It, it just has happened, as Chris pointed out, the IHC uh, was developed by Governor Tarullo, not by this uh, uh, current uh, board. But you can see from the foreign bank perspective why they see this as a reflection <laughs> of a global <laughs> approach. So I want to pick up on a banking pun uh, of disparate impact and transition a little bit to American consumers. Uh, In the financial crisis... I want to see how you're going to do this. (laughs) The concept on disparate impact, on the regulatory treatments that affect certain groups of people more or worse than than others. And while leaving Dodd-Frank, the Federal Reserve's financial regulatory authorities were expanded significantly... The one area where the Federal Reserve saw a transfer of authorities was in consumer protection, which had frequently been neglected, not just at the Fed, but across federal banking regulators. Congress created a new uh, agency tasked with doing that, the CFPB, put in charge a series of forceful uh, single independent agency heads. One former head is is sitting in the room right now. Uh, Under this administration, The president's chief budget officer has been placed in charge of that and has gone about taking a much sharper course correction than I think any of the other bank regulators. Course correction, or is it veering off the road? Well, one could say it's it's a uh, 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 it's a good question, Kathleen. Let me ask you then. Follow up on that. You've seen these crises before. You use the term "reach for for your wallet," which I think is shorthand for consumers ought to be afraid. Uh, Holistically speaking, is there a connection in financial stability perspective between the new White House-led CFPB's perspective on consumer regulation and what's going on in terms of fine-tuning and calibrating other bank capital standards? So this has succeeded in making this really wonky. It's not a wonky subject, especially when you have a crisis. He is going to have to, he meaning the 
speaker, Quarles, uh, is going to have to preside over a system. And within that system are these FDIC-insured institutions. We struck a bargain. You're have, you have the sh uh, taxpayers on the hook. And that with deregulation, Graham Leach Bliley, which just formalized deregulation, you then put that safety net over everything. And I guess in real times of crisis, I, you know, we used to let investment banks go under. But it stopped when you really think about their affiliation with FDIC-insured institutions, which I'm fine with. I don't think it's a problem undoing Glass-Steagall. But there was a lack of oversight, of policing. And, uh, and, and I would like, first of all, I would just like to say this. I would hope we would never have to have the, use the phrase non-bank bank again. But here we are with the ridiculous um, you know, Mr. Odding who considers the banks his customers. Um, but the ability to repay, what's going on at the CFPB, is extremely pernicious. They are saying we do not have, we can give loans again. Go ahead, give loans again to consumers without assessing their ability to repay. That was always a code for uh, you can abuse them at your leisure. And let's not forget, and this is something Bernanke really stressed after the last uh, crisis, that you imperil consumers at your own risk. They account for se six to seven cents of every dime spent in the economy. And what we discovered is they didn't need more credit at the end of that crisis. They needed less debt. They had been abused. You need to have common sense. If you are lending people money without assessing their ability to repay it, I always tell my students, believe it or not, th these are the very things that the toxic subprime did. Why are we there again? What are they thinking? <laughs> and then Paul's just like, Chris. Uh, no, I'm looking that way in this. Okay, way. okay. Um, so I think that there are definitely ways in which um, you know you can expand access to credit as well as access to other vital financial uh, services, whether it be insurance, even healthcare, uh, and that the way that you do it is is important. I do want to note that when you look at the housing crisis, right, um, you know, loans were extended to people who couldn't pay, and uh, there was on a, terms they couldn't repay. On terms that they couldn't, that they didn't understand and were purposely they were misled about. Right, but I'm trying to say that the per, that the incentive behind it was that you know you looked around and you know houses they, were no that was always a card. Kathleen, they were Kathleen, never let, trying Kathleen, to increase housing. Kathleen, let let Chris. Okay. I think that there was a, largely a desire that you look at minority communities and you want to make sure that they can participate in GDP growth and economic growth to the same extent that their counterparts because houses are, at least historically, have been uh, financial assets that allow for the creation of, of wealth. It's, it's, that, that's, that's not a, a, a controversial statement that I'm saying, and I think that many people particularly... Uh, not just, frankly, on, on the Hill, but others would, would look at one's house as, a, as, a, uh, as their primary uh, family asset. Now, you know, the way in which you can encourage that can come about in different ways. And uh, one of the things, you know, if you were trying to responsibly think through uh, financial inclusion and a wider participation in the financial economy, there are, there are ways to do it. And um, I personally disagree with a lot of things that are happening over the CFPB, including their, their policing of discrimination policies and what's happening with their office over at the CFPB. That being said, to, you know, I'm someone who, I teach law, you know, and I like to look at institutions, I look, like to look at things in their particularity, and, you know, if you're going to create and generate wider financial inclusion, you may want to think about um, alternative data, the kind of incumbent data that's gen been yeah. generally used to facilitate um, uh, the provision of credit, which has had a disparate impact on uh, <clears throat> women, small businesses, as well as minorities, and you can think through how you want to, which was really one of the original ideas behind uh, Project Catalyst and some of the other CFPB goals, um, as designed by other speakers who have come through here, including one of your uh, senior fellows, Michael Barr, and to think through, well, how do you, how do you trigger and, and lever um, uh, other kinds of tools in a responsible uh, way. 
And I do believe that as with many things in financial regulatory policy, when you have people who are, um, and I'm not talking about anyone in particular, but as a general phenomenon, when you have in the regulatory uh, agencies folks who are on the front lines of uh, political battles, that can lead to um, a, a polarization of the, de- of the debate where sometimes uh, you know, it's better to look at the end end goal and to achieve the kinds of outcomes that I think that you're very, and that we're all very um, passionately interested in and and in achieving. But I do think that, yeah, the the CFPB's approach has been uh, more aggressive um, ostensibly than some of the other financial regulators, and I personally would would, uh, explore other kinds of options to achieve the kinds of ends for which the agency was originally uh, devised and created. So I'm, I'm going to turn to the audience for their questions now and, and give Rajan and Randy the opportunity if they want to weigh in whether or not a series of new consumer abuses could potentially lead to a, a repeat of what we saw before with a sleepier CFPB. I just, you know, the um, answer, I think, in part, first of all, could consumer abuses lead to a financial crisis? Here I agree 100% with Kathleen. The evidence is there. It could. There's no question about it. But whatever the CFPB's position may be, uh, the bank regulatory agencies were not stripped of their authority to examine these institutions, and they are examining them as fully and as comprehensively in the consumer area as they were two or three years ago five years ago, so I think there is, what Congress did was create a double level of protection. All right. Who in the, who in the audience has a question? Right there. Stress testing and the Basel is based on you you get some accounting number out of the balance sheet and maybe you adjust it, and then you multiply it by a ratio like 8% for capital or 10.5%. And then for the stress tests, they increase some of these numbers based on judgment. But you're still, getting, you're still taking a balance sheet item and multiplying it by some ratio that doesn't change for market conditions. So the, the 8% capital for banks like insurance companies, if interest rates are really low, that's bad for their business. If the yield curve becomes highly inverted, that's usually bad. So, but that doesn't change these ratios. So the, the, at least as far as the Basel what, numbers what, are concerned. What's the, the question is? Okay, whereas the life insurance industry does 10,000 scenarios stochastic of monthly cash flows, and that actually sets the capital number. And so um, for me... My question really is, this has been going on for 30 years. Why is, the banking, why is the banking methodology so primitive compared to life insurance? I have no basis for knowing whether it is or isn't. So. Maybe they have state regulators. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, any, uh, I, I, think, I think with insurance and banking, you're dealing with apples and oranges in terms of the, uh, a bank. You give them... Your money, and they, uh, you, you, the, the, a bank gives you their money, and you promise to repay them. With a life insurance company, you give them their, your money, and they promise to repay your heirs. Right? By definition, you'll never. They're not going to repay you. <laughs> uh, and so, I think you have to you have to look at that difference. We have a question over there, Alan. Answer. Well, hold on. Ah. We, we, and, no, no, we, no, no, no. We're not. We're not answering other audience questions. We're giving the audience a chance to question the. Panel. Okay, I'll rephrase it as a question. Uh, <laughs> data in the insurance world is far better than data in the uh, banking world. Uh, anyone who is an objective observer of the uh, banking world understands that the central problem with data in, hobbles their ability to do analysis. And so the question is, uh, given that there are now um, uh, open source free data standards for financial instruments uh, being created, why have the regulators not adopted this to uh, enable the uh, uh, type of assessments that the insurance industry does? 
Data standard question. I, I really am going to uh, plead the same fifth, that, uh, or actually it's the 11th, ignorance on this issue. Um, you know, I, I think, though, that life insurers and banks are not the same animals. They may be both animals, but they're not the same. Uh, to Aaron's point, who pays whom, but also life insurers have very long-dated liabilities and long-dated assets. That's not where banks are. So having different systems doesn't mean uh, that there's something inherently fallacious in one or the other. I, I fully agree if there are opportunities to use better data, it should be used whatever you are, the, the, where, whatever type of animal you are, but the animals are just, I don't think, the same. Dennis? Hi, Dennis Kelleher, Better Markets. Um, I, I hate to break with the theme here and ask a question related to what you're talking about, but um, uh, two points. One is on uh, the threshold, whether it's fifty billion or a hundred billion, or you pick your number. Let's remember that uh, there's almost well, it's shy of six thousand banks in the United States. If the threshold's at fifty billion, there's only about forty banks in the United States with more than uh, fifty billion dollars in assets. This is not an insuperable or huge class of banks for the Fed or any other other regulators to deal with. And even at $50 billion, and Better Markets actually put out, because this has been debated for so long, a fact sheet under 165, the Fed had full authority to tailor above $50 billion in every type of prudential standard that was to be applied, similarly for the stress test. So the issue was not that they couldn't do it. And in fact, our argument, and we showed that they did do it before. The question now is whether or not it's appropriate based on an individualized risk assessment of the banks. And the question for you that I have is whether or not you think they get there closer on an individualized risk assessment based on actual activity. Size was always the threshold question, not the substantive analysis. And the second point I wanted to just get your thoughts on is on FBOs. I mean, let's remember that foreign banks received trillions of dollars from US, the U.S. government. Um, frankly, you know, the Fed substituted U.S. taxpayers for German taxpayers to bail out Deutsche Bank's U.S. operations. And then Deutsche Bank and Barclays, as you both know, reorganized themselves to avoid the capital rules, which is what forced the Fed's hand on the FBO rule. So uh, I agree completely, Raj, that there's a lot of discrimination or a lot of, I should say, apparent discrimination, particularly on the law enforcement side. A little bit less clear. So the question is... Um, doesn't the United States have a self-interest? If, they're going to, if we're going to pay the bill, shouldn't we make sure that, in fact, the bill next time for the foreign entities are going to be ideally as low as the bill will be for U.S. entities? All right. Two questions. Answer? Yes. That was the answer to question two. That was the answer, yes, to question two. Question one, on individualized risk assessment versus categorical assessment. Right home. Yeah, I'm happy. So it's interesting because if you actually look at the um, tailoring proposal, which that's my label for it, uh, um, they do actually have an alternative possibility, which is they've got the they've got the categories the way they've defined them now, and then they've actually talked about having another approach that seems more close to what you're talking in terms of risk based, sort of a multi factor individualized assessment, kind of like the way the GSIB um, are done, GSIB surcharge. Um, that strikes me as a, interestingly, probably maybe one of these trends you're talking about because it might be more precise, but it may be more complicated and complex as well. And there is some value to simplicity. I think I wanted to get your original point, which is I think part of the problem, part of the real push for these new thresholds and raising the threshold from 50 to 100 is the fact that the Fed over the past past eight years didn't actually tailor things. And so you found a bank with $52 billion in assets that was subject to virtually the same CCAR stress testing requirements as uh, the largest U.S. GSIB. And that didn't make a whole lot of sense, and that really irritated a, a heck out of a lot of the smaller <laughs> banks. And so they then, then complained to their you know, members of Congress and Senate and so forth. And so um, I think that was, a, that was probably, in retrospect, a mistake. Probably should have tailored things more in a... In a um, and I saw this also on the living wills. I mean, the idea that some of the smaller institutions were required to do living wills with the same kind of guidelines, part of the problem there was that the original guidelines, the regulators were kind of in the dark 
feeling their way, trying to figure out what guidelines should we have. And so there's a lot of experimentation. That's one thing. It's one thing to have that kind of experimentation with the banks with very large resources. It's another thing to have that experimentation take place with the smaller banks where it was, where it was really a heavy burden relative to their size. So I think that um, I think tailoring is a good idea. It should have been done a long time ago. So I, I had a, a, a quick response, though, I, I would say to the FBO and the question of the German tax figure. And, I, you know, we're just in an environment where um, I'm increasingly mindful of, of, of the implications of, of, you know, this, this, this urge here. But even when you look at the fact that, yes, either through our swap lines and through other uh, varying um, assistance provided by the United States uh, in the wake of the financial crisis, you know, I, I would only urge that we not forget why many of these countries were in troubles in the first place, because they were taking other wonderful exports from the United States, including U.S. Gene, uh, blue jeans and credit default swaps, which impaired the balance sheets of different institutions um, who were themselves, uh, you know, their balance sheets were intertwined with those of, of sovereign governance, and, and obviously uh, because of the strategic place of the U.S. dollar and the international financial system, they needed uh, a line of credit. But, you know, it's, it, it, it wasn't a one-sided relationship, and the reason why many sovereign governments were finding themselves in financial stress was not entirely due to their, to, to what they did themselves, so... Um, we, we live in an interconnected world. We live in an, interna in an international economy. And, uh, you know, that's that. But once again, the regulators weren't keeping track of the risks. Instead of using derivatives and uh, collateralized debt to mitigate risk, they were allowing these banks, foreign and domestic, to use them in a way that amplified it. So again, they fell down on the job. The question should be, how do we get regulators to do their job? and that's to protect the public and the taxpayer. Hi, uh, Sabrina Terry with Unidos US, formerly the National Council of La Raza. Um, I have a question that may be a bit tangential, but it's linking back to the discussion around access to credit or increasing access to credit and capital. Uh, the OCC has proposed monetization of the Community Reinvestment Act. I would love the panel's feedback on how those proposed modernizations may or may not lead to disparate impact for traditionally underserved communities and if there are areas that are lacking within the proposed rulemaking um, that should be addressed or at least should be um, assessed in their, you know, process. TRA is the legislation banks love to hate and hate to love, they, but they do like it privately. They think it's worked pretty well. Um, and they, they, that's what they will tell you privately. And for three decades, I've heard them say that. Um, but the, we don't know what the proposals are. But again, I am... I am anxious about what the proposals will be to change it because, again, we're hearing about consumer choice, innovation, access to credit, all the buzzwords that were being used for the housing crisis when, in fact, it, and, and we're opening doors to home ownership when, in fact, nine out of ten of the mortgage backed uh, security, of the mortgages underpinning the toxic mortgage backed securities, went to people who already had a home, including disproportionately in the black and Hispanic communities. And in, in, because the house is the number one way that people move up the economic ladder in this country by causing so many people who had a home, putting them into a bad mortgages, mortgage, causing them to lose their home, that effect is going to be felt in the economy for decades. Those people, so I think the devil's in the, de we haven't seen the details of what they're going to do, but so, I'm worried. So, 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 so two things, and I, I, the, the point of the, and I'll get to the CRA in, in just a second, because it's particularly important as applied to set something like the FinTech Charter, right? Where, for example, you know, if you're going to talk to members of CBC, it will be of uh, enormous importance for Maxine Waters and others. You know, to what degree are you going to uh, you know, make sure that the CRA in both its principles or form or in some way or another are operationalized in a world in which you are engaged in online lending and where it's much more difficult to discern and identify the geographic boundaries of both the credit provider or the lending entity and the ultimate cu customer of those services, right? And that's going to be a question that I think, particularly given the election, it's going to, there's going to be a lot of attention to that. 
and frankly, uh, for people who are traditionally concerned about access to capital, in particular for minority uh, communities, the question has always been, if people are really interested in access to capital and financial inclusion, and frankly, having a much more balanced growth of the American economy, then you have to make sure that everybody, that everybody is involved in it and is participating. And that's going to be a question that's going to arise when it came to the earlier issues relating to the housing. There was goodwill, I think, behind a lot of people who wanted to make sure that everyone was able to participate in the American dream. But the rules that are developed by regulators to achieve that don't always get those results. And the question that will be posed here with the OCC, and I think we're, we're, we're largely intersecting, is you know, how do you lay out those CRA rules, for, to the extent that I understand them, I think that they've been, that they're in the process of, 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 of uh, getting comments on the, the CRA proposal that's just been released, and many of us will be providing those comments. Could I just very quickly, uh, I, I think I ascribe fully to this point Chris is making, the debilitating impact of economic inequality uh, is something <coughs> we need to deal with. There are so many ramifications, but in a, in a modernization of CRA could be very helpful. CRA is now 40 years old or so, and it's still based on a branch model, That's right. bricks and mortar. Um, that's not where so much of financial services is today. and. We need the, the agencies to get in a room, sit down. This should be a very high priority because it could be so helpful in the area of economic inequality. So it could also be very harmful. Yes. Uh, it's interesting that only the OCC has moved forward. Uh, there is a finite amount of regulatory bandwidth that the Fed and uh, uh, Vice Chairman Quarles laid out a pretty uh, uh, aggressive and real-time agenda uh, did not mention CRA, nor did the Fed go along with it. But I've long held that the single best thing the Fed could do to help address income inequality is move to a real-time payment system. For the 60% of Americans who live paycheck to paycheck, who get huge check cashing overdraft fees, when your check clears is the matter between billions of dollars, in the aggregate, billions of dollars or needing a payday loan. For the 40% of us who always have money, never touch the zero lower bound in our bank account, we frankly don't care and we're oblivious to the large economic consequences of a payment system that I think is state of the art from the United Kingdom of uh, 1853. Uh, the UK uh, got real time payments in 2007 when the first iPhone came out. I got an iPhone 10XR yesterday and a check that uh, if I deposit it, today in the bank may be available on Wednesday or Thursday next week. Rajan, the, the, the Fed's come out with a proposal here, or a, a, a request for thoughts. They're holding town halls across the uh, country 10 years after other central banks adopted the same technology. Uh, wh wh what do you think is going to go on here? Well, I am concerned, and as you started <clears throat> to avoid any... Um, misperception of conflicts of interest. We represent the clearinghouse, which has an RTPS up R and running. Real-time payment system. system. Up and running. And frankly, uh, I, I don't think it is useful for the Fed to be going out. They had their faster payment system tax for, uh, task force, what, three or four years ago. What would really be useful is to support with <coughs> their uh, they are going to regulate it. They'll be able to fully in every way, including uh, true ubiquity in the sense that the small banks, the Dennis referred to the 6,000, which did not develop the system, have access on full and fair terms. That's where I think the Fed should be going because I agree it is a real issue that needs to be dealt with, and we've waited too long. Only because... Last word. Well, only because I actually thought that I was, you know, going to be talking about crypto assets to some extent. You know, there's this very interesting question of central bank digital currencies, and we were over at the IMF just last week, and it's a question as to how can you operationalize some of the uh, financial inclusion, faster payments, 
much lower um, uh, uh, cost and more uh, competition with the traditional banking sector through, if not uh, innovations with from everything scaling or, or from a from the scale of uh, accounts with central banks to central bank digital currencies. And I agree, it's very important, and I'll let everyone go home. <laughs> Great. Thank you all very much. We appreciate that. Your time. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.